All right, so at this point, uh, we're getting some input. So if I type in a name and click go, it's it's getting our input. That's uh, that works. It's not that smart, however, because what's happening is, well, what if I put some numbers like one, two, three? It'll say great, and it'll input it, but that's not a valid name. So it'll even put symbols. Well, there's Yosemite Sam yelling at me, um, but it'll take that. And what about if I simply click go? It'll take that, an empty name. All of these empty names. So we haven't programmed any sort of valid input. We're not going to do that just yet, but just be aware of that. Uh, that we have something in our minds that the user is going to type in their name. But there's many ways that the user could surprise us. We'll say it in a nice way. And so um, we need some validation, which we'll get to that later. And this is often the cause about how sites get hacked. Whenever there's some sort of input box, depending on many factors, the type of software or the, or the language, this could be a spot where I type in, you know, database.delete. I could put in a, a command here based on what this code is. And here it'll just take it as a string. So it did save it to my array. It says right there, delete database. <coughs> That's not a valid command, but it did take it. And so we're not quite dealing with all that data sanitation yet. But this is how sites can often get hacked because of these input boxes. Uh, we'll deal with some of that stuff later. I want to display content on screen now. So we're going to need to back up, back to our main body section, so that we have some placeholder to display the data in our array. So let's back up to line after the end of the form, before the script, give yourself a new line there. And we will create here a div. We started to talk about divs last time. We didn't actually do that much with the div last time. We had bullet points. We used that element to display our data. Here we will use a more generic container, the div container. And this should have an ID so that we can reference it in the JavaScript. So the ID attribute. Now, a couple of people have asked me, what's the difference between using double quotes and using single quotes? There's no difference. Either or will work, but you should use them consistently. That is, if I start my quotes double and end it single, that's not valid. If you notice, everything got purple and weird. Double quotes, it's correct colors. So if I start a single quote and end with a double quote, that's not valid either. I can do single quotes here and do double quotes everywhere else. That's fine. You just have to have the same pair of quotes. Technically, if you just do single quotes, it's faster because you have to do double quotes with shift quote. And so maybe a faster way is single quotes. Either or will work. We've been doing double quotes the whole time. We'll keep doing it, I guess. But anyway, we'll work. And this will have uh, a unique identifier. This will be div name show. Question? Why is the input doesn't have backslash Where at? What line? Uh, this one, uh, this input is a self closing tag. It does not have a pair. So it. Uh, doesn't have a closing tag. It's This is its tag itself. Sometimes you see that people write it like this, space slash. Um, that's one way to write it also, but with modern HTML5 that's not necessary. This is the same thing. So this way or that way. Okay, so we've got this placeholder. It's defined with an identifier, which is one way to have us then manipulate it. What I want to use that placeholder for then is to start to display the data in the array. 
So we'll get back to our JavaScript section. We need to now start to decide, okay, based on the example that I showed earlier, we have many ways to retrieve the data. Remember, we have show me all the names in sequence, show me one random name at a time, or show me all the names in a random sequence. I have all those three ways. We'll start off with the basic one, which is just show me all the data. This is what um, div name show will be about, show me all the names. And I'm just prefixing it with div because that's what this element is. It's a div. Just like I had, you know, this is a button. It's a type button, so I called it btn go. And up here, BT, uh, input name because it's an input type. And so this is a div name show. Um, we need to create a button to show the results because we just have a button to save the name and cancel saving the name. So we'll write a little bit more HTML to create a button to display the results. So um, let's back up. Um, give yourself a new line 14 before the end of field set. This is still part of the form. Input boxes and, and buttons and such are, are usually inside of a form, so we'll keep it in the same form. Uh, what I want to do is however create an HR a horizontal rule and then another input type button value show all names or just show all show all names that'll be fine we can put whatever we want of text in that button a, a button with a really long name though is kind of cumbersome and might not be so good for user experience interface. This needs an ID so that we can reference it via uh, JavaScript. Call it btn show all. There's a button to show all the names. Take a quick look at my uh, screen here. And a button that will show all the names. Doesn't do anything yet, of course. We've got a button. When we click the button, then it will display those names in here. In order for this to be an active button, we are going to need to do something very similar to what we had here. An expression that activates the button, and then a function that does, that handles the event of clicking. So before the end of the, I forgot to say this at the beginning, this uh, I-I-F-E, it's pronounced iffy. You know, like this is an iffy proposition. Iffy. I-I-F-E, an immediately invoked function expression. It's an iffy. All of our code will exist inside of the iffy. So we're going to add some more code, make sure it's inside of the, the curly braces before the end of the end of the iffy. So next lines here. For the end of the end of the iffy, we're going to do the same thing. Some sort of event handler and or, and then result. So, document dot get element by id. In quotes, btn show all. That's what we just call the button. dot on click once that button gets clicked do something if something is run a function we 
we have name save. Maybe a good one then is name show. Name show. So the button is active, basically. Click it and run name show. We then need to define name show, just like we had up here. So next line, function. Name show. Make sure you're spelling it exactly as you typed it. These things can be called anything you want as long as you're consistent. So if you've got spelling mistakes, that's fine as long as your spelling mistakes are consistent. So we need to do something there. We need to show that name. This will be pretty straightforward. We will say document.getElementById. What do we call a div again that's going to display everything? Div name show. I forget the names of my things all the time, but it's div name show. has uh, properties. Remind me, did we talk about text content property previously? Blank stairs, okay good. We're going to talk about inner, uh, inner HTML. We had document.write that would write stuff to the screen. Um, and document.write was okay for, for beginners. But we need more complex things as we get more complex. So we've got this inner HTML property. It's not a method. If it was a method, it would have um, parentheses. It doesn't have parentheses. It's a property. There's an object that we are referencing on screen. We're going to then change its inner HTML, whatever is in that div, that's then assign some new HTML, some new content. It doesn't have to literally be HTML, because what I want to do is display all names. I want to display the array that holds all my names. All names is my array that holds all my names. Therefore, display all those names in that element on screen via HTML. Um, save it and run it. Now, you're going to need to put it, some names in again, because every time we reload, we actually destroy our variables. We destroy the array. We haven't made that those permanent yet. So if you refresh or run your code again, you'll have to put in a few names, and you're going to get tired of putting real names. Just put gibberish for a quick input. So I'm putting in some data into the array, and then show all shows the data. You get tired of putting real names, so gibberish is fine. Let's pause there. Our button should then display the data of the array. You need to put data in the array because it destroys every time you reload. And you'll need a little help getting that to display.
So another ship opened up, and uh, the window opened up, which will distract us because then now we have the sounds of nature to bother us.
Okay, everyone, so uh, hopefully you're getting some result. Uh, let me mention a couple of uh, slightly off-topic things here. Uh, as you write your code, the magnification of my code, I have it a little bit larger for you to see. If you feel that the, the size of your code on your screen is a little too small, you can go to View, Zoom, and then you have some zooms. Uh, zoom in, zoom out, which is telling you control number plus. So on your keyboard, you can't pull the keyboard, but control plus on the number pad will increase the size of your fonts, so you might want to read it a little better. Control minus on the number pad, not on the number row, the number pad, decrease the size, increase the size. You can also apparently hold down control and scroll wheel, scroll up, scroll down on the mouse, and that'll zoom you out in and out of your code too. The zoom that I have I think works pretty well for the class, but if it's too small on your screen, you can zoom in and zoom out. Control plus. Um, okay, so what are we getting? We're getting some console output. Okay, uh, here this is a relatively easy result to achieve, but what I want to do is think a little bit about in terms like this. What if um, the user comes to the program at this point and then says show all. It doesn't look like it's happening, but it is trying to display an empty array. I want to take a little moment to give some user feedback saying we can't display any names, you haven't saved any names. So we will do a little bit of user interface work here. This is going to happen at the point that the person clicks show all. It needs to check are there names to show, yes or no. If there are no names to show, give some sort of result. If there are names to show, give another different result. This is now when we need to do control statements, conditional statements. We need to do these, we need to write these commands to check on a condition, to check if something is true or false. This is how the we can program it to make decisions. This is also known as decision statements, conditional loops, you know, conditional statements, a way to make a decision. I have basically two things to, to consider here. Let's do this. Inside of the name show function before the actual output, give yourself a new line and we'll create a variable here. We've created three variables so far. This, this third one will be called uh, name len. I'll explain in a moment. But we're creating three variables to hold uh, objects or simple data. The first variable holds the whole array. The second one holds the temporary name that the person input. And this third one is name len, name length, which is how many items are there in the array. The variable that we created at the top of our code is a global variable. I'm going to back up and give a comment. It's a global scope variable can be used by any function anywhere in the code, in the JavaScript code. Global scope objects, global scope variables can be used anywhere throughout our code. 
So that's why this function here was able to access uh, all names. It was created up here. This function can then use it here. When we create objects, like variables, inside of a function, then they get local scope. Local scope variable can only be used in this function. The name save function. So we've sort of like invented a mini world here called name save. And we can put in here a thousand lines of code. And if we create any variables in this little world, they can only be used in this little world unless we return them back outside to the rest of the world of the main code. And there's pros and cons to doing both of these methods, both of these techniques. Um, local scope variables, or local scope objects, only exist as long as the function is running. So they are more efficient and use less resources, less RAM and processing power and all of that. The opposite then is true for global scope. As when we invent this variable, it's going to be used as long as the whole app is running at all points, at all time. Uh, that data is going to be stored in memory at all, for all time, as long as the software runs, when it's global. Therefore, it's taking, taking up more resources. Therefore, it's slower. Because inside of a function, we only have to deal with the variables we created in the function, which is easier to keep track of. And then if they're created outside, well, we might have many more variables to keep track of. It's less efficient and slower. Uh, one is not better than the other. One is just needed at certain points global scopes are less efficient use more resources not necessarily worse option than local scope and then here not necessarily necessarily better than option than uh, global scope. It doesn't matter for us too much at this point, but if we try to do, if I went to line 46, which is outside of the function, and write console log temp name, it would give you an error. Because I'm trying to access a variable inside of a function, inside of an object. And I didn't specify which object to look for which variable. On the flip side, I can use any global variable in any function. We're creating a brand new variable name length that is going to be populated by or assigned all names object dot length property this is going to check the length of the array how many items are there in the array length is the keyword for items in the array so we're going to store that at the moment I've got one name saved so name len will be 1. If I put 40 names, name len will be 40. I'm doing this so that I can check, is my array empty? If my array is empty, then display to the user. No names to display. Uh, or else there must be at least one name. Show, so display, show that name. Next line. Uh, we'll do a simple... Here's the part where we actually make the decision. We will use the uh, if statement. I'll write it completely first. It's skeleton if else. So I'll write all of that before the document get element by ID part. If else. 
this is checking for something being true. If it's not true, then it must be false. So we're either checking for it to be true or else it's false. If something is true, do what's in this block, or else it must be false. So do what's in that block. It's sort of like checking yes or no, not exactly, there's nuances. For all intents and purposes, at the moment, it's sort of like checking yes or no, sort of. So we'll say this is the if, oops, comment, if conditional, conditional statement, conditional loop, conditional statement. Um, check for truth of if run code run code run first code first block of code if true or else run second block of code if false If we get a true result from evaluating a statement, if we get a true result from asking a question, run the code here. And this can be a thousand lines of code between this first curly braces. If we ask it something here and the result is false, well then jump to over here and do all the lines of code inside of else, which could be one or one thousand lines. The question that we're asking here, or the condition that we're checking on, the condition is namelen is not equal zero. Exclamation point equal does not equal. If namelen does not equal zero, that means there's something in the array. If name length namelen is zero, that means there's nothing in the array. If there is something in the array, uh, display on screen, or else there's nothing in the array, so display to the user no names to display a message. That means this statement, where we displayed results on screen now, needs to be in one of those two. So I need to move line 58 to 54. In Notepad++, this is kind of cool, watch this. If you select the line of code, you can drag and drop it. Instead of doing cut and paste, just drag and drop your code. Select your line drag it and drop it. So what we're trying to do is if it's not empty, display results. If it is empty, this will be the else part, we'll, we'll do an alert. We'll tell the user Sorry, no names to display. So we've seen uh, now like a third, maybe even a fourth, I think it's a third use for the equals. So equals is very complex in JavaScript and many languages. It's an, ass it's an assignment operator, which is line uh, 44. We was, we've assigned the null value, the empty value, 
to that input box. We've also used it up over here as um, an expression for, use, for using expressions, evalu evaluating expressions. And over here, then, now we're using it to actually kind of test things in a sort of logical way. It's a logical operator here, then. Um, let's see how this works. I'm going to save it. I'm going to refresh my code. If when you refresh it, the, the array should be empty. Show all. Sorry, no names to display. As soon as I start adding names, display displays a result. It made a conditional decision. You had to decide what are the items in the array. Right here we checked. Show the names, but first check what is the length of the array, how many objects, or how many items in that object. Store it here. Then that's either going to be, you know, empty or some number. As long as it's not empty, display the result. Or else it must be empty, so display an alert to the user. These sorts of things we will do very often. We need to check, uh, create conditions, right? Conditional statements. And we've got like four different ones to check things in different ways uh, or to loop through through data. Uh, here is one of the easier ones to work with. It's basically true or false. Is this thing we're checking true or is it false? We can have more complex uh, checking here, but this is fine for the moment. the moment uh, we display the the names and they show up maybe I want to uh, hide the names so uh, let's create another button here this is show all buttons hide the buttons of course we can set this up as a toggle the same button to do more than one thing it's a little more complex than I want to do at the moment. We will have one obvious button to show the names, one obvious button to hide the names. Later we can do toggles, which requires more if statements and conditions. Let's create another button. Show all names, hide all names. So that's HTML. The content of the document then is HTML. The interactivity is the JavaScript. So let's go back to the end of line 15 at the very end we will add another input type button value hide names ID so we can reference it via JavaScript, btn, uh, hide all. Based on what we've written so far, we're going to do something very similar where we need an event handler and all of that. So let's make sure that this is set up properly, that we've got an input button and that it has that ID. I'm going to copy that ID because I'm going to forget it two seconds later. And so down at the end, down at the end, uh, we'll create, very similar to what we had here, the document.getElement uh, event handler and then the function definition, same thing. So before the end of that, 
uh, iffy. We'll have again document.getElementById. That's getting a little tedious to type. Eventually, when we get to jQuery, uh, which is like a different flavor of JavaScript, we will actually be able to write that in a very compact shortcut. Right now, we're using plain old JavaScript, which is a little verbose. When we get to jQuery, it's like shortcuts. And basically, all of that will get translated into this. We can't write that code yet because we don't have the jQuery library activated. So that won't work. But all of that will become that eventually. The element we're dealing with is btn hide. Hide all. Dot on click equals function parentheses curlies etc. as before. And we're going to say that will that will run a function that we will invent. Um, we'll call it uh, name clear. We there we then therefore need to clear. We need to define name clear on the next line. Function name clear. And a uh, little shortcut here. I'm going to copy line uh, 54 where I, where I have there the div name show. I'm going to copy that line and paste it into name clear. And the trick is I'm going to set that to null. I'm going to set that to empty. This, in essence, then is hiding those names. We're not dealing with the actual data of the names. Those are still safely intact in the array in the variable. But here on screen, I'm just blanking out that div. So I've got a button to show the names. So then, so then the inner HTML property is set to all of those items. And then here now we're saying hide it. And so the result of that is I refresh my code, I've got a new button, I'm going to put some data in the array, show all, hide names, show all, hide names.
Okay, so um, that shows and hides. We've got this data that we're collecting. Okay, now let's get interesting here where we're going to pull random names out of the array. Right now it shows the whole array. Now I want to start to get a random name out of the array. We need then some sort of trigger to get to pull that out. So we're going to create another button. Uh, this is going to get a little crowded, so I'm going to put it on the next line down. I'm going to put another horizontal ruler and then another line down there, and then that'll be get random button. So back to our code, line new line 16, another HR for the visual divider, and then another input, type button, value, get one random, id, btn, random one, not the number one, but the uh, the word one. You can use numbers in uh, these ID names and such, so I could call it random one. Um, that could work, but I usually spell them out as, as full names. Random. As long as I misspell that consistently, it'll work. I was going to copy and paste it so it would have worked, but yes, random one. So then we need to do the whole dance of get element by ID to find a function, and then the inter interesting stuff will happen after that. So uh, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to just to make sure that exists. There is get one random. Um, oh, before we get down to our code, we'll, um, we'll remember that we're going to output our, our data here. Now, here's a, a choice that we have to make. Uh, we can reuse the same div over and over. However, from our level of knowledge, we will only be able to use it for one thing at a time. If we click show all names, it will show all names in that div. If we uh, get one random, it'll empty out all the names that are visible and only display one random name. And then eventually when we tell it, show me all the names that are in a random order, it'll empty out whatever's in it and only show all of them in a random order. Perhaps at the beginning here, it doesn't quite matter, but if I wanted to display all of those, like in my example, where all three of those bits of data are displayed in, in, at, at the same time, that's because they're all being displayed in different divs. We're going to borrow the same div, but remember, refer to the example code at the beginning of the day to show a different variation on it. Uh, so, we will get back down to the code at the bottom, a couple of enters. This is just for aesthetics, we can all run it all together, but I do recommend a little spacing here and there and the tabbing. This to me is like a logical unit. At the moment, it doesn't quite matter what the order of it is, but I'm grouping together this um, event handler with the function definition. And then here we'll say, we'll call this, we have name show, 
this might be a little long name show random one it's better to be obvious perhaps than compact because if we write it in like shorthand and such are we going to remember what that means a week later if we get back to our code or a month later or if we work with other people and we're not all on the same page about our naming conventions it might be okay then to give it long names so the next we need to define name show random one function you know this could be anything it could be called kitty cat and as long as we use these names consistently it'll work copying and pasting is very useful function name show random one Let's copy line 56 again, the line that's back on the name show, which uses that div and displays the array. Let's copy that and paste it in this random one. So our, our original all names array output. Just copy that from the previous, the second previous function. And what this does is, it, as we saw a moment ago, this will display everything in the array. When we were experimenting with JavaScript for the first time on, on Tuesday, we had an array, and we wanted to pull one item of the array. Anyone remember how we did that a long time ago, two days ago? Square brackets, and then an index number. So if I want to display the second item of my array, it's a 1 because we start counting on zeros. So this will display one item from my array, not all the items, just one item, index 1, which is 0, 1, the second item. This assumes, of course, we've got a second item. Just to see if we're on the right track, let's save and run it and put in at least two items into your array. One, two, three, get one random. It's not really random yet. I'm telling it which one. My array Q is the first index item. Get one. Well, it's Q. That's what that's saying there the first index item. If I reload it to clear my array and add real names just to show you, get one random, not really random, but it's the second item. The point of that is that I'm uh, showing you, reminding you, that we can get one item out of the array. Well, I want to get a random item. At the moment, I've got three items. I may have three or thirty or three hundred or three thousand. So using our random number generator built into JavaScript, we can randomly choose one of the items of the array. We can randomly choose an index of the array then we can display whatever that item is on screen. So before we actually display the chosen name, we need to generate a random number. Um, based on the number of items that are in my in my array. Name Uh, to 
just to show you this. Where do we have? Oh, right here. Yeah, name Len. We're going to create the variable. We're going to recreate the variable name Len. Again, we cannot use name Len. We cannot simply write name Len to use it. We've already defined previously the length of the, of the array, the name array. But it only existed in, in that function. We cannot use that value. We have to invent it again. We have to set it set it again. So create var name len again equal to uh, all names. We can access the all names because that's a global object length. So store whatever number of names are in the array. Store it in in there, and actually we're going to create another variable, so I won't end the statement yet. I'll put a comma. We're going to create more than one variable, so here's our first variable, comma, here's our second variable. Random name equals. We have a built-in JavaScript um, object called math. It's with a capital M. That's just the way it is. Math. Um, that's the object. And then dot random method. Semicolon. That'll create a random number. End of line. So semicolon at the end of that line. Console dot log. Random name. Save it and run it and check your output. It's not going to work yet. We're not there yet. But save it and run it, check your output, check out this random number that we're generating. Use a built-in JavaScript object. Random number generator. Using random numbers then, we're going to pick a name from the array at random to display. Refresh. Uh, you don't even have to put anything in the array yet. I'm just going to get random. Random number, random number, random number, random number. It's in uh, fractions. It's from 0 to 1, which is still an infinite number of numbers, but it's between 0 and 1. Math.random is creating a random number between 0 and 1. Well, I need whole numbers not um, fractions. Uh, and I need to bind it by the name len. If I have seven names, I want a number between 1 and 7, not between 1 and 99. I want to get this random number between 0 and the, and the length of the array. So the trick is, before the end of the statement, before the semicolon, space, shift 8, which is multiplication. We're going to take that random number and multiply it by name len. Name len is then the maximum length of my array. Oh, this time you do need to put in at least one thing in the array. I put a few items in the array first, because obviously here it's going to be some random number times zero. If I hadn't put anything in the array, that's zero. Whatever times zero is zero. So the random number is zero. Put in some some items in the array, and now we'll have, if I've got three items, random number times three. So I get random numbers. 1.2, 0.7, items in the array. If your console output is getting messy, you have the clear button right there. Sometimes I'll clear it so I can just focus. Clear that. Get random. 
3.9, etc. I am getting numbers that are bound by the number of items I have in the array. Still getting it as fractions, though. I, I need it in whole numbers, but it's getting there. It's starting to create a random number in a range based on the items in the array. I have another math, built-in math operation, which will round my numbers so that I get whole numbers. So we'll further refine this by putting parentheses around that little expression right there. This uh, means we're going to execute this part of the code and then do something else to it. It's like you know, in a regular old math, if you have 1 plus 2 times 3 divided by 4. Don't write this, of course, but the, er the order of these things matters. Remember that? Do I multiply it first and then divide it, or then do I divide it first and then add it? Those things have an order of operations in regular old math. So here, in our JavaScript, we do want to force this, that create a random number, based on the length of our array, and then we're going to round it. So we'll back up before um, those parentheses, and we'll say math.round. Actually, those parentheses also serve to be the parentheses for that method, math.round parentheses. But I wanted to put the parentheses so that we don't forget to close the parentheses. This now will give me round numbers. I'm going to refresh it, add some items to the array. Check those random numbers, whole numbers. So we have all of these built-in JavaScript commands and such and we use them as pieces of a puzzle to create something larger. We have a random number generator, but then we have to bind it by the length of our array, and then we have to round it so that eventually then we can pick an index, because there's index 0 and 1 and 2 and 3. There's no index 1.7. There's no index 99.772. There's either 99 or 100, so we need to round it. This Rounding, however, is either going to round it up or down. And the problem with that is it might round it up. If I've got 4.5, it'll round it up to 5. That could mean that I'm suddenly going to select an item outside of the range of my array. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is my fifth item. And if I rounded it up to 5, I'm trying to get an item outside of the range of the array. So I want to force this to always round down so that we never go past the maximum number. We have math.floor. The floor is down. What's up? Ceiling. So we have math.seal. Seal. To round to always round up. So normally uh, a 1.1 would equal 1. But with math.seal, a 1.1 will equal 2. With math.floor, a 1.1 would go to 1, and a 1.9 would go to 1. If we do math.round, it will decide up or down based on the classic, you know, between 0 and 4 goes down and 5 to 9 goes up. But with floor, we will force whatever number to the lower number. That will also include now if we've got uh, a 0 0.9, that will include 0, which is the 0th item of the array. On all these other ones, especially uh, math.seal, 
we'd never get a we'd never get a zero. A zero point nine would become a one. A zero point five nine 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 would become a one. Uh, with math.seal, a zero point one would become a one. So we'd never get the zero with index. Floor guarantees we get the zero with index and never go past the maximum index number. So the whole point of this now, we're not going to be having it retrieve an exact hard-coded value. We're going to have it retrieve a random value. There's a random value. That variable is storing a number. We put a number in the brackets to retrieve an index. This variable is holding a number. This variable retrieves helps us retrieve an index. Round it down. Okay, now it should work. Put in a bunch of names, maybe some real names this time. And then click random button and see if you get a random random name. Four names in the array, get one random, Joey, Joey again, Tommy, Johnny, Joey, Johnny. Sometimes the number may happen more than once, that's why it tells you that that number appeared twice, randomly. That number appeared three times, randomly. When you have a small set of numbers, it'll be less random. When you've got more items in the array, it'll be more random. So if you only got two names in the array, it, it might have the same name over and over and over because you've only got two items to randomize. More names, more random. Has anyone figured out what names I'm choosing here? Anyone into... Huh? Anyone into classic... Uh, you went into classic uh, punk bands. You guys don't know the Ramones? Joey Ramone, Johnny Ramone, Didi Ramone, Tommy Ramone, Matthew Ramone, Richie Ramone, and CJ Ramone? You don't know? This year is the 40th anniversary of the Ramones' first album. No one knows that? <laughs> now you do. So I'm pulling out random names from the band, displaying them on screen. Right, we've been at this a little while, so let's pause here for one more break. Um, if it doesn't work, call me over. It's 8.33. We'll take a slightly shorter break. We'll be back at 8.40, so just about seven minutes. Back at 8.40, and then we'll program it a little bit more. If you need any help, call me over. Can you show me your line 15, please? Yes.